in a number of features. So even though they may have distinct uh, features to identify them as separate themes, we would still have to depend on ultimately on the multidisciplinary approach to them. That's an important fact to keep in mind. Next slide. Now this is a registry uh, devised by Dr. Virendra Singh in Jaipur and he has published the kind of disease we have in India. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis is actually uh, at the top of the list, but generally we find that the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is the commonest in, in uh, most parts of the world. And other reports have said that uh, this uh, UIT is indeed about 50% of the number of IITs in India. So when we are confronted with the potential interstitial lung disease or idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, we need to have a few questions uh, right at the outset. And that is, what, what are the major subtypes which we have just seen? And what are the important clinical, pathological, radiographic findings in each of these subtypes? And what kind of treatment is available for that particular subtype? So, we do know that uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the major types we've already sometimes we've seen, and I'm just going to go over some of the important clinical radiographic and pathological findings to make it easier for us to recognize these uh, conditions in clinical practice. Now, as I said, the UIP IPF is potentially the most lethal of these diseases and with the worst prognosis. The others, even though they have distinct characteristics, they can all be pretty much lumped together because they behave somewhat similarly and, and, and also respond to treatment uh, similarly, except for perhaps AIP. But we'll come to that in a moment. So the most important distinction to make is, does the patient have UIP or is it one of the other diseases that we just said? Now that distinction will help us to prognosticate and also decide what treatment we should give. There was a time when interstitial lung disease will automatically uh, result in a course of steroids. At least there's a trial. And I think this is, now uh, we'll shortly see that this is not the right way to approach uh, IIP or ILD either. So there are several differences between UIP and the other diseases and one is that Complete recovery is possible with every other disease except for UIP. And why that is so also we will see shortly. So immunosuppressive uh, treatment, smoking cessation, everything will improve survival. Everything except UIP. Median survival is very bad in UIP, only two or three years. And no therapy has been shown to reduce the uh, severity of the disease. Till recently we have a few drugs which are somewhat effective. So the diagnosis of UIP actually does not require uh, a biopsy because if it is characteristic enough clinically and if you have particularly the, a good CT scan, HRCT, and if the findings are characteristic enough, that should be enough to make a diagnosis. And it is confirmed in fact the gold standard of uh, diagnosis for this particular disorder is a multidisciplinary approach. Biopsy can sometimes be required when the disease is a little uh, ambiguous in that it may be the early stage of UIP where it may resemble some of the other diseases that we just saw. So the limitation of surgical biopsy is that it's not always possible. Once a patient is somewhat ill and he is hypoxic, uh, doing a biopsy is obviously going to make it worse and he may tip the balance end up on a ventilator forever. So I think we have to be very circumspect about recommending a surgical biopsy and transbronchoscopic uh, biopsy is, is never recommended in this particular group of diseases because the uh, size of the uh, biopsy sample is usually inadequate and therefore an open biopsy or batch biopsy is the one which is done and this is not feasible in many patients. And even after you've gone to the extent of uh, troubling the patient for an open lung biopsy, the pathologists may differ in their interpretation of what they see. And so it's not always possible to make a definitive diagnosis even with a surgical biopsy. <coughs> so
So, a multidisciplinary approach, as I said earlier, is the gold standard. Now, without surgical biology, you have to be careful that you can't lump a lot of people into this. You have to make sure that the clinical features are uh, uh, with the uh, UIP. The HRC, the CT scan, um, now has improved so much over the years that we do find good CT scans almost everywhere. But I think the quality of the CT scan, the way it is taken, no movement artifact, all those are important to make a diagnosis of UIP without the biopsy. And then to make sure that there is no alternative uh, diagnosis if a TB has been done and no lymphocytosis in a bronchial of the body. Now sometimes bronchoscopy is indicated even if you're not going to biopsy in the lung and that is primarily to exclude infection because as we all know most of these diseases, most of these patients with this disease will be treated as an infection because they do come with cough, they do come with fever, they have clinical features and they have x-ray abnormalities and sometimes they have fever as well. And so uh, it is difficult not to put them on antibiotics, even though I don't know if the survey should approve of that. But uh, they often end up with every antibiotic uh, to begin with. And uh, when everything fails and the patient's going on relentlessly worsening, that's when we think there's something else going on here. So when we do that, a bronchoscopy would be sometimes essential to exclude that the patient has an infection. Um, so if you diagnose UIP, it means that there is actually no need for a biopsy most of the time. And the treatment is not going to be very helpful. And most importantly, the prognosis is not going to be very good. And there will be a, a gradual decline, and sometimes a somewhat more rapid decline, as we can see. So the third thing that we have to ask ourselves is about ground glass. But this is something that you will come across frequently again and again in the description of the radiological features of all the IIP cases. And we may need to know what exactly ground glass is. Of course, we all know what ground glass is. If we, if we make a door for a bathroom and uh, we're going to put glass there, obviously we're not going to make it a very transparent, easy to see through glass. It may be a glass which will give light, but doesn't allow you to look through that. But that's a kind of ground glass appearance. This would be there's a little bit of translucency there, which is the ground glass appearance. And this is only a, a, a degree of opacity. When it becomes a little denser as it is in there, over there, it can be called a consolidation. So it's a kind of less uh, dense form of consolidation, which is called ground glass. And you can even see it in the chest X-ray in certain areas. And here it's become consolidated there. So uh, that is important to understand because you will come across it uh, again and again. And here that there is a kind of diffuse form of ground glass appearance in both lung, especially in the lower regions. And one of the distinguishing features about this is that the blood vessels which we normally see over here, it cannot be seen distinctly but you can still see it as though through a fog or a mist. So that is another feature that it's a ground glass appearance. <clears throat> so it can be both in a CT scan, where, where it's easier to see, there's not a particularly good picture, and also in a conventional chest x-ray, where you can see the kind of haziness normally. And sometimes this can be uh, due to fluid actually, if a person is lying down and you take a person with uh, a chest x-ray of a person lying down, bed x-ray, you may find a kind of haziness which will look like that, so we need to distinguish that from this. So this is the consolidation which we saw earlier, which is the denser form of the ground launching in here. Now we come to the non-specific interstitial pneumonia, which is uh, another type of IID, but here the prognosis is better. Now you'll find that some of the clinical features here, the age group, the uh, male to female smoking history. Now that's another important point. You'll find that almost everybody who has IID, they, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, there seems to be an association with smoking. So in fact, two of those diseases you'll find are very closely related to smoking, so whether they should be really called idiopathic itself is being questioned now. So smoking history is important, and the clinical feature everyone is familiar with, there will be bilateral crackle, and sometimes you'll find that once fibrosis is established, you have a characteristic, well-pro character of the crackle. The 
lung function test is almost invariably restrictive unless there is an associated airflow obstruction. So there are different diseases which can mimic this. Collagen vascular disease also can produce interstitial lung disease and the appearance clinically and radiologically could be similar to that. You can have extensive aller allergic alveolitis which can be acute, subacute or chronic. Uh, resolving acute lung injury will have a constant picture of that. So obviously you have to look through the history and look at this spectrum of clinical findings as well as the background in which this diagnosis is made for us to distinguish between somewhat similar uh, diseases. The drug history is important. An infection, as I said, is often the most important differential diagnosis. Now there are two types of NSIP. Um, there's a cellular type and a hydrotic type. The cellular type has more of an inflammatory nature and that has a better prognosis as well. Obviously, the fibrotic type is less reversible and therefore it may progress relentlessly on to become somewhat like UIP and produce respiratory failure eventually. So the cellular subtype, uh, radiographic findings is mostly ground glass opacity and in the fibrotic type, as you will guess, there's quite a bit of fibrosis and traction bronchiectasis which can result from that. And here you find the reticular opacity, a kind of network like pattern there, and a, a ground glass pattern over there. And in the CT, again you see the reticular pattern and the ground glass pattern along with some traction bronchiectasis. So, one of the important differentiating points in the fibrosis between NSIP and UIP is that it is temporarily homogeneous in NSIP. What does that mean? It means that when the fibrosis does occur, and you see it in the CT scan or even in a pathology specimen, everywhere, the fibrosis is uniform everywhere at the same stage of evolution. It is not advanced in one place and an early stage in another place. So that uh, is what temporarily homogeneous means. The NSIP has with many other types of IIP other than UIP, you will find that in temporarily homogeneous fibrosis, whereas UIP, it will be heterogeneous, as we will see. And little or no honeycombing compared to uh, the UIP where you get characteristically the honeycombing pattern. So treatment for this is um, the same, it's glucocorticoid. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know that steroids have been effectively used in many cases of IIP and these are the ones. And UIP is an exception to that. But here you find cellular type has an excellent prognosis. Fibrotic type somewhat less so. Ten-year survival is thirty five percent for that. Immunosuppressants can sometimes be used to spare steroid. Now acute institutional pneumonia is uh, another very important disease where there is a very rapid progression of the disease and it can often mimic an infection and it's very difficult to make a diagnosis here because the progression is quick and it, there's hardly any time to uh, biopsy the lung. So cough and dyspnea last weeks to month and 50% have fever and 50% have uh, finger clubbing as well. There are different conditions like ARDS, shock, sepsis, radiation, chemotherapy, toxic inhalants and viruses which can mimic that. So the radiographic Findings are a kind of diffuse ground glass, once again, confluence uh, in many places, some areas of consolidation, very few areas of bronchiectasis, etc., fibrosis. Here you see the diffuse uh, um, inflammatory uh, kind of pattern of uh, ground glass here, and here you see it in the CT scan a little bit better, bilateral ground glass here in both these lungs. And this is a little more denser one, by this time the patient is probably in respiratory failure and possibly on a ventilator. And there are three stages here, the acute stage, organizing stage, and fibrotic stage. And you can see that this is progressing at a fairly rapid rate. So within about six to eight weeks, the patient has actually gone on to the fibrotic stage, uh, unless of course the patient has recovered. So the treatment uh, is mainly supportive because steroids unfortunately don't work all that well here and uh, more than 60% of them uh, end up dead in fact. So most deaths occur within the first six months. Those who do manage to survive, they completely get rid of the disease and there's hardly any sequelae following this. The, um, the ILD of uh, uh, respiratory bronchiolitis 
is definitely associated with smoking and still heavy smoking, current smoking is there. And that's one of the important things about this. And again, it has a similar sort of clinical and radiological features of, of uh, ground glass capacity. One feature here is its central lobar in uh, pattern, unlike the earlier ones we saw, which was more diffuse. And <coughs> here, we need a biopsy usually by a vast probe because the disease is on, around the terminal bronchioles and therefore TDLD will not be of much help. And there's hardly any fibrosis found here. The treatment and prognosis is excellent for that way. The smoking cessation is by far the most important and uh, some response steroids can also be anticipated. The least preventive interstitial pneumonia is the next one. Again, it's found mostly in smokers, fourth or fifth decade and it produced restricted PFDs and some of them have a digital clubbing. So uh, uh, that can mimic a number of other diseases. So it produces changes which are very similar to the other diseases as well. And here you can see the kind of diffuse ground glass opacity with a little bit of fibrosis. And here we find again temporal homogeneity in the evolution of fibrosis. UIP is probably the most important and here you see that it is found in older people and it produces a typical wealth profractal digital clubbing and progressive respiratory failure and it has to be differentiated from other similar diseases which can present with similar fashion. Radiographically you'll find a lot more fibrosis and you can see the uh, peripheral reticular pattern there of fibrosis and uh, honeycombing is very characteristic of this particular disease. And once you develop honeychromia, this is a relatively earlier part of the, uh, uh, the disease and you can see that it is somewhat similar to the NSIP we saw earlier. But this is an advanced form and where you have traction bronchic phases and uh, honeycombing. And this is uh, again bilateral extensive fibrosis and this is probably the end state of the disease. So if they are consistent, the CT scan like the last one we saw uh, will definitely make a diagnosis of UIP and make it unnecessary for you to biopsy it. And therefore, um, okay, I think I'll skip through this uh, to uh, come to the treatment. This is the different types of uh, development of the disease and you can see the decline can be variable. And uh, we know that initially we used to treat it with prednisolone lithotacrine and NSTAR-16 triple therapy which is no longer recommended, strongly discouraged in fact, and corticosteroids also no evidence to support its use. But other drugs have been shown, shown to have some effect. Perfinidol, for instance, is now being used. It's a, uh, an anti-fibrotic agent developed in Japan and is now uh, one of the mainstay of treatment for this disease here. And you can see that clinical evidence is in support of it and uh, it has found to reduce depth of progression of the disease. Nintilandin is another one which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and it uh, is involved in cell signaling leading to fibrosis. The dosage is 150 mg twice daily. Perfinidone is uh, 200 mg one to three tablets three times daily. So different things to show that Walker and Bosentown are all useless in this disease. So lung transplant you should find has to be a soft too. Oxygen is always a very good idea for people who are hypoxic, rehabilitation, increased extra swallowing, and uh, screening for pulmonary hypertension, structural sleep apnea, and GERD. These are all important adjuvants to treating this uh, very important group of diseases. So, summary uh, the interstitial lung disease is a very important group of diseases, but fairly complex, and we have to distinguish the interstitial. Um, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia is a subgroup and distinguishing UIP from the others is a very important part of our work for population. The biopsy is not always required. Treatment for UIP is very unsatisfactory, but for the others it can be quite good. So an NPC approach, again multidisciplinary approach, which involves the surgeon, the physician, the pathologist, the radiologist, etc., is essential for making the diagnosis. Um, some uh, references which were used for this talk and uh, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much. I request Dr. Chandrasekhar to come forward and have a reciting of the session. Please come, sir.
next time.